Hey everyone, in this video we're going to be looking at Chapter 1 of The Mythical Man Month by Fred Brooks Jr. This is one of the seminal pieces of literature about software engineering and is a very logical follow-on to my series about peopleware, which is in a similar vein. Chapter 1 is called The Tar Pit and is what is being referenced by the illustration on the cover, which is a mural of La Brea Tar Pits. But before we get to that, this chapter starts out with a quote, which is a Dutch proverb and says, a ship on the beach is a lighthouse to the sea. No explanation is given, but I suggest that the adage means to say that we may learn from the mistakes of those who went before us, and I hope that this book and this video series will have such an effect on us. Back to the tar pits, though. In prehistoric times, some of the fiercest and most intimidating creatures from that era met their untimely demises not from combat, but from being dragged down slowly but surely into the muck of tar. Large-scale systems programming is analogous to that, and we are all trying to emerge unscathed. Anytime we try to get out entirely, some kind of blocker pulls us back. It's a sticky situation, and we might best be able to understand it if we start out by examining the joys and woes of system programming. System programming, as we call it, is distinct from programming because there's a lot surrounding the program that makes it a system. So let's get into that terminology a little bit and try to suss out what the author is talking about here. A program is the kind of software that a team of one or two individuals could write. It can be built quickly and can work in the manner intended on the framework that they used to build it with. This is, this, this kind of baseline, this is kind of the baseline definition of a program that people think when estimating productivity of an engineer or two. In the real world, that isn't the end of the story, however. In the real world, there needs to be productization, which brings us to a second term, a programming product. This is all of the above, but includes being able to be run by anyone, edited and extended by anyone, used in arbitrary environments with arbitrary sets of data, with sufficient documentation to get new users familiar in a reasonable amount of time. The next way a simple program can evolve beyond its creator is by, some, is by becoming something called a programming system. To become a programming system, the program has to be one of many programs which interact gracefully with each other, with all the possible interactions considered and tested. For the sake of magnitude, consider that a program that is part of a programming system will cost three times as much to make as a as a result of its place as part of a whole set of programs. But having covered all these, the goal of a program is not to evolve into just a programming product or a programming system, but into a programming systems product. It, as the author says, costs nine times as much time and effort to bring into existence, but is ultimately the goal of programmers and their companies all over the world. The latter sections of this chapter are about the joys and woes of programming, and we'll look at the joys first. Why do people like to make software? The author suggests several things. The first is that it is joyful to create things. This needs no further explanation. The second is that people derive pleasure from creating things that are helpful to others. In fact, this one resonates with me quite a bit, and perhaps you too, as you realize that people will be benefiting from the work that comes from your mind. Third is fascination with solving puzzles. Writing even very basic software is challenging, and when you finish, you get a sense of accomplishment that you did something not only creative and useful, but also that required some mental fortitude and cleverness to achieve. Fourth is that there is joy in ongoing learning. It keeps us young, and it keeps us inquisitive. Much as it would be nice for that to be the end of the story, there is also a dark side of the craft of programming. The first is that perfect performance is required. Computers are unforgiving at guessing intent and don't even bother to try. If the code you write isn't perfectly executable, there will be errors, either obvious or bugs hiding in wait to ambush you later. The second is that there's typically a disconnect between the one who has decision-making authority and the one who actually does the implementing. It is inevitable as a team grows in size beyond the first handful of developers that there will be hierarchies, stakeholders from other teams, and so on. And the ones who triage and balance priorities are typically not the ones who write the code themselves. 
or, as the author so succinctly put it, one's authority is not sufficient for his responsibility. Next, designing is more fun than implementing, but for every hour of architecting a program, there are many more hours of slow work implementing it in practice. The architecting is the real fun, debugging never is. And speaking of debugging, isn't it always like the last few bugs that take the longest time to solve? There certainly are more things that can go wrong. These are the highlights. Things are usually worse in our imagination than reality, and for all the woes, we still have the joys to make it all worth it. That's all for this video. I hope you found it helpful and thought-provoking, and I'll see you all in the next one.